It is the eve of Palm Sunday. Luca Andraus weaves palm leaves into traditional designs. Like one big family, an ancient Christian community in the Egyptian countryside prepares for the beginning of the Holy Week before Easter. Beni Suif, a small town about 100 miles south of Cairo. It is Palm Sunday. At Easter time, this small community of Christians relives the events of Christ's death and resurrection. These Christians are members of Egypt's Coptic Orthodox Church. They represent a small Christian minority living in the shadow of a large Muslim world. In the whole of Egypt, Copts number about four million, just 11% of the population. For them, Palm Sunday and the week that follows is a vital affirmation of their living faith and their very existence. The church courtyard echoes their praise. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. In procession, they accompany their bishop, Athanasius, who carries high the gifts of sacrifice. Ten-year-old Marcos Hakim has been chosen to play the part of Christ, to reenact the entry into Jerusalem. As the procession moves through the crowded street, hundreds of people push to greet him. The air is filled with the scent of flowers, herbs, and spices, and everywhere the strong aroma of incense. The climax of the day is the blessing of the palms. The faithful have gathered in the church courtyard. From a neighboring rooftop, Bishop Athanasius throws holy water onto the waving branches below. The palms will decorate their homes and give blessing for the coming year. With each shower of holy water, the crowd shouts for more. We want water, we want water, they roar, as the water splashes and the dust rises. We want water. Throughout the centuries, water has been especially revered in this land dominated by the desert. Water for thirst. Water for cleansing. Water for growth. Water for blessing. Water for new life. Give us water. Modern dams now regulate the river's flow, but all along the Nile Valley, ancient means of irrigation persist. Ingenious tools and methods pictured in pharaonic tombs are used today to raise the life-giving water into the fields. Cultivated land in Egypt is precious. Only a narrow green ribbon bordering the Nile will support vegetation. The barren desert just beyond is a constant reminder of the vital importance of their farmland. Birth, life, death, seeding, growing, harvesting have been interlocking cycles of centuries unchanging. 
Muslims form the dominant majority in Egypt, but the Christian presence is a strong and vital one. Churches and mosques face one another on many streets. Like most other minorities anywhere, the cops have often faced prejudice and discrimination, times of persecution and martyrdom. But there have also been times of tolerance. Today, there is a renewed friendship between Christians and Muslims and a respect for each other's religious conviction. Tradition holds Christianity was brought to Egypt by one of Christ's disciples, St. Mark the Evangelist. Earlier still, according to the Gospel, the Holy Family fled here from Herod's wrath. This sycamore tree in Mataria, a suburb of Cairo, is one of the places where Mary, Joseph, and the child Jesus are believed to have rested during their flight. Such Christian shrines live on in the shadow of the great domes of Muslim mosques. Everywhere, from before sunrise till sunset, five times a day, the Buesin calls all Muslims to prayer. There is no God but God, and Muhammad is his prophet. That call is one constant reminder that this is predominantly a country of Islam. Still, in spite of this overwhelming presence, there is much evidence of Christian life and devotion. As both Muslims and Copts point out, Egypt today is a good example of how they can live together and share. A dramatic incident in Zaytun, a suburb of Cairo, gave new encouragement to this harmony. On April 2nd, 1968, a Muslim workman in the neighborhood saw a woman dressed in white walking on the roof of a small Coptic church. He thought she was in danger and called out. A crowd gathered and recognized it as an appearance of the Virgin Mary. Today, people from all over the world make pilgrimages to the church of Zaytun. They come to seek comfort and help for themselves and their families. Some claim to have been miraculously cured of lifelong diseases. Shahira Fanous once saw the apparition herself. Now she has come to ask a blessing for her forthcoming child. The apparition of the Virgin has recurred many times since 1968. Sometimes she is standing with outstretched hands or moving slowly between the domes of the church. On certain nights, she seems to be praying. Father Boutros Gaid has seen her himself. She, she uh, appeared here in this place, exact in this place. And she kneeled, knelt to the cross and she blessed the crowd of the people. Here was uh, thousands of people standing around uh, this narrow street is uh, this narrow street and here was uh, thousands of people all awaiting the apparition of St. Maria. And the last uh, president, Gamal Abdel Nasser, came in this villa, was hiding and, and uh, he saw her, saw the apparition himself. And afterwards he said, leave the Christians, do as uh, they want and to enjoy with the apparition of Santa Maria. is the real heart of the Middle East, the intellectual and spiritual capital of the Arab world. But it has always been open to new ideas from everywhere. It is a real metropolis with the dynamics of both East and West in riotous tension. 
an atmosphere not only of live and let live, but also of lively witness and interchange, forever present in the texture of daily life. There are over 100 Coptic churches in Cairo alone. The most ancient are found in the old Christian quarter on the edge of modern Cairo. This historic center has maintained its integrity. It has changed little since these churches were built in the third and fourth century. The famous hanging church is built upon and against the old Roman fortress walls. Outside its peaceful courtyard, the neighborhood market. Like the pyramids, the ancient Coptic quarter is an organized tour for many sightseers visiting Egypt. There they find not dead museums to the past, but a quarter filled with the daily life of Coptic families, the churches, true communities of celebration. It is Monday, Thursday, the Thursday before Easter. Behind this low gate is the Church of St. Sergius, almost hidden from sight, one of the oldest in Cairo. During Holy Week, Copts from everywhere come to visit here and the other churches in the Coptic quarter to share the age-old liturgies of their community. It is like a pilgrimage. Here at St. Sergius, Father Gabriel, the parish priest, blesses water for today's service. The use of symbols and triangles throughout the Coptic liturgy is an inheritance from Pharaonic Egypt. Copts trace their ancestry directly to the Egypt of early history, unlike most Muslims who have descended from the Arabs and others who spread Islam. Some Copts are recognizable by their distinctive features, and they are marked by their names, usually borrowed from apostles, saints, or other New Testament figures. Names such as Miriam and Martha from Mary and Martha, Boutros and Bulos from Peter and Paul, and of course, Mata, Marcos, Luca, and Ioana from the four evangelists. In today's liturgy, the community follows Christ's invitation. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example, that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither is he that is sent greater than he that sent him. As Christ washed the feet of his disciples, the priest has symbolically washed his assistant, Father Ibrahim. He in turn performs the same ritual washing of Father Gabriel. <coughs> then the men in the congregation come forward to be washed and later the women and children.
Meanwhile, in a small room called Bethlehem, adjoining every Coptic church, holy bread, or korban, is made. Each loaf is stamped with a special seal, a cross divided into 12 parts to symbolize the 12 apostles. Once, the baker collected flour from all members of the community so that the bread would be made from what they had given, their own share in the sacrifice of which Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall never be hungry. I am the bread of life. If anyone eats this bread, he shall live forever. The bread which I will give is my own flesh. I give it for the life of the world. During Holy Week, Copts spend entire days within the church. They relive and enter into the events of Christ's Passion. On Monday, Thursday, they share in his Last Supper. On Good Friday, they die with Christ. At Easter, they will rise with him. In the Bethlehem, the Korban is finished and is placed in the oven. It will be used in the next communion service and will be sold at the church door for parishioners to share with their families at home. Holy Bread, the Staff of Life. Thirteen centuries before Christ, the Pharaoh Amhotep IV saw the sun as the single source of life, and so he became the first man to declare that there were not several gods but one supreme power. For him, the whole rhythm of life, seen through the changing seasons, was directed by the power of the sun, Aton. He changed his name to Ignaton, spirit of Aton, and with his queen, Nefertiti, built a new capital to honor his god. They called it Akhetaten, horizon of Aton. He wrote this hymn, Beautiful is thine appearing, thou living sun, the first who lived. Thou hast fashioned the earth according to thy desire with man, and all that is upon the earth, thou alone. But Ignaton was born before his time. When he died, monotheism died with him, and Akhetaten was destroyed. This is all that remains. The capital was moved back to Thebes, and the Temple of Karnak once again became the center of worship to the many gods of Egypt. Thirteen centuries later, St. Mark brought to Egypt the words of the Gospel the news of the rising of the Son of Man, a new season for the glory of all creation, the love of one God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer. It is Good Friday in Cairo. For Muslims who make up about 90% of the population, each Friday is a holy day, a day to gather at the mosque for special Friday prayers. Here, near the old bazaar of Cairo, stands the Sultan Muayyad Mosque, a historical monument of the 15th century, the flowering of Islam. In the courtyard, the faithful perform their ritual ablutions before joining in prayer.
For Christians, Good Friday is the day to remember Christ's death on the cross. Through the day at the Church of St. Sergius, Coptic families have come to share in Christ's hours of suffering and finally his death and burial. A parishioner is reading the story of Abraham and Isaac, familiar to both Muslims and Christians. It's a reminder that God stayed the hand of Abraham, but let his own son die for man's salvation. The parish priest, Father Gabriel, senses the beer where the icon of the crucifixion is displayed on a bed of rose petals. At the mosque, the Muedzin calls the faithful to prayer. In different variations, he declares again and again, there is no God but God, and Muhammad is his prophet. At St. Sergius, the liturgy proceeds to the moment of Christ's death. Through Holy Week, the Copts are reminded of the suffering of their church also. They call for God's protection against all evil. Lord, have mercy. In the mosque, Muslims prostrate themselves before God, the merciful, the compassionate. In submission to the God who is great. Dismantled. The community chants in sorrow again and again, Kiri Ilesan, Lord have mercy. <laughs> Behind the screen of the iconostasis, in the most sacred space of the church, Father Gabriel prepares to bury the icon of Christ's death on the cross with rose petals and spices as Christ himself was buried. Christ, a man among us. At the same time, he was God. Christ, a man among us, at the same time he was God, yet truly man, having a body in truth and not seeming, in order that he might die a crucified felon and accomplish the death of all things in his body. Christ, a man among us, at the same time he was God, for being life itself, he died so that we may be made alive. The 
chanting of the Kiri Ile song continues with increasing fervor. The words will be sung a total of 450 times, facing first to the north, then east, then south and west. These positions reflect the tradition of Pharaonic Egypt. Christ, a man among us, at the same time he was God. For being life itself, he died so that we may be made alive. The burial is completed. An icon of the crucifixion of Christ is carried through the church for everyone to see, to venerate, to touch. The icon speaks of suffering, of Christ's suffering on the cross, suffering for man's sins. The cross is fervently touched by the faithful. The cross, a tree of suffering, of torment and shame. Cross, wondrous cross of wood, glorious with gold sumptuously shining. Cross, blessed of all trees, blessing of all creation, triumphant shield, mark of our salvation. Cross, bond of our family, sacred tree of life. The cross, affirmation of belonging, tattooed on the wrist of many Copts, according to old custom. Here at Dendera, an early Christian church was built within the walls of the Pharaonic temple. The cross, new sign of life, replaced the Ankh of ancient Egyptian faith. A startling new vision of man redeemed the dark of ancient deities. At Sohag, the winged sphere and cobra still remain in the portico, symbols of long forgotten mystic power. The ancient temple itself transformed into a Christian monastery. As more and more temples were converted into churches, the Coptic cross began to appear all over the country, in villages, towns, in cities. Christianity was to become the dominant force in Egypt for the next five centuries. Today, Coptic communities are still found all along the length of the Nile. In many, neither religion nor lifestyle has changed since their earliest days. Just across the river from Luxor, not far from where King Tutankhamun was buried, is the tiny Coptic village of El Barat. All the people living in El Barat are Copts. They draw their meager livelihood from small farms where they grow corn and wheat. Their days are long and hard, especially now at the time of harvesting. The village priest, Abuna Basada, visits the workers regularly. He was born in El Barat, and his family numbers close to 500. It is known as the priest's village. His father was a priest also, and so was his father. In the countryside, this has been the custom.
تعالوا كلكم مع بعضكم تعالوا It is time for a rest for Abuna Basada has arranged for a young girl from the village to bring tea for the workers. The Abuna seldom leaves the village, except to visit the nearby town of Luxor across the Nile. His eldest son has ventured further afield to Sohag, about a hundred miles to the north, to study for the priesthood. He will be more educated than his father and his father's father, because now studies have become more rigorous. But Abuna Basada will stay in his village. He lives his faith in the way of simple, pious tradition. Here he brings God's sacraments to his small band of followers, as his family has always done. Saturday evening in Cairo. For most of the city, it is a normal working day, like any other. A day for going out, for shopping, for enjoying the city. For the small Coptic community, this Saturday evening is the climax of Holy Week and the eve of Christ's resurrection from the dead. The major service of the Paschal Vigil will take place at the yet unfinished St. Mark's Cathedral in downtown Cairo. It was opened by President Nasser in 1968 and is the seat of the Patriarch of the Coptic Church, His Holiness Pope Shenouda III. Important dignitaries are beginning to arrive. By the time the service begins at 11 o'clock, over 6,000 people will be packed into every corner of the cathedral. The excitement is intense as they await the arrival of Pope Shenouda. Many people have been in their places waiting for as long as five hours in anticipation of this moment. The Pope's arrival is greeted with applause and trilling cries of joy. have a warm affection for their chief bishop. To them, he is not only the leader of their church, but he has played an important part in bringing about the new dignity and self-respect that Copts have won in Egypt. He has made them aware of their own identity as Copts, and he has encouraged all efforts to preserve this identity. There is a revival of the ancient Coptic language. New seminaries are opening for the training of priests. Sunday schools for teaching young people now are flourishing. The study of Coptic art and music is being revived. In the Holy of Holies, the Pope prepares for the blessing of the bread and wine.
body and blood of Christ, Christ the Redeemer, a revelation of God and man that Copts struggle to preserve for all Christianity against heresy. Misunderstood and persecuted, but persisting in that glorious truth. We believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is God and man, God of the substance of the Father, begotten before the worlds, and man of the substance of his mother, born in the world. Perfect God and perfect man, who, although he be God and man, yet he is not two, but one Christ, who suffered for our salvation, descended into hell, and rose again from the dead. is now in darkness. Behind the closed curtain in the Holy of Holies, Pope Shenouda reveals the icon buried on Good Friday. The wrappings are removed, and the congregation waits for the triumphal announcement that Christ is risen. Outside the Holy of Holies, the cantor sings, Open the gates, let the King of Glory enter. curtain is about to part for the supreme moment. Christ is truly risen. With applause, trills of joy, and firecrackers, the procession enters the most sacred space, and the icon of the resurrection is carried around the altar and into the community. They relive and affirm the life of Christ, who renewed the image of man. He was a child in the womb. As man, he walked among us. At the same time, he was God, blazing with divine energy, present in all things, by his own power giving order to all things giving life to each thing and all things, quickening the whole universe, yet truly man. He hungers and thirsts for us, though he gives us food and drink as his saving gifts. Yet truly man, having a body in truth and not seeming, in order that he might die a crucified felon and accomplish the death of all things in his body. For being life itself, he died so that we may be made alive. He suffered not the temple of his body to remain long in the grave. He raised it up on the third day, incorruptible, victorious. Dying, he lived. Living, he died. And of all imaginable blessings, this was the greatest.
The rapture about a new man inspired Coptic art, nourished that tradition in a world where the image of man is vain and idolatrous. Today, young Coptic artists are developing a new school on those traditions. They're working in icons, stained glass, fresco, and mosaics, creating images of Christ and the Holy Family. In their art, they too are celebrating the dignity and the glory of man. They work in limited facilities and with only the most basic materials. Most of them have full-time jobs and visit their studios only in the evenings. But among them, they are not only bringing about something of a renewal in church art, but they are creating for their fellow Copts an appreciation of the unique Coptic experience. At St. Mark's Cathedral, the Paschal Vigil continues. Pope Shenouda is delivering his Easter message to a rapt congregation. Many people record his words to reread in their homes throughout the year. At the close of the service, Pope Shenouda is greeted by the official visitors representing the president, the army, and many branches of government. Their presence at this event demonstrates the close relationship that exists today between the Coptic Church and the state. This social and political affirmation is of great importance to Pope Shenouda. He is keenly aware of the delicate balance that exists between Muslims and Christians and has moved slowly and tactfully into closer dialogue with the state. Pope Shenouda's heart still remains in the remote desert monastery of Al Suryan. There he spent eight years of his life as a monk, often as a hermit, in the total isolation of a desert cave. Each week, he faithfully returns to the monastery in the Wadi Natrun, 60 miles into the desert, northwest of Cairo. Always, he is welcomed as a brother by the monks. On this visit, the Pope is meeting with a group of monks from Alexandria. They are discussing plans for the expansion of the monastery and the building of new cells. These cells are being built to accommodate the increasing number of young men who wish to follow the monastic way of life. Christian monasticism is on the increase in Egypt, a rare occurrence in the world today. A growing number of educated young men are choosing to dedicate their lives wholly and totally to Christ. For Pope Shenouda, these regular visits to the monastery are a vital part of his present life. 
His cell stands, among others, in the sand surrounding the oasis of Wadi Natrun. Here he returns to the life of solitude he knows and loves. Of course, the life of solitude was far better for myself. But the service of God is better for other persons. We have to, to leave some of our spiritual wishes for the sake of others. The Egyptian deserts were suitable for the life of solitude. The monastic life in its origin was a life of solitude, a life of prayer, a life of contemplation, uh, and not any other thing. The monks used to have all their life for prayer, to consecrate the whole life for God only not to have in mind anything but God alone, not to care for anything but only the salvation of the soul, how to love God, how to leave everything for God's sake, for being with God always, how to have God abiding in heart and in mind all the time, not to care for anything but only for God only, to be intermediates between heaven and earth, uh, to ask for the church, to pray for the church, to have their holy life as an example for others, to live such quiet life in order to be also quiet in their heart, quiet in their thinking. If also they advise any person, they may give him a quiet advice. Uh, they are not uh, mingling with the disturbance, with shouting of the world, but through the quietness of the body, they may gain the quietness of heart and the quietness of thinking. Through all of Christendom, the monastic life grew on the tradition that St. Anthony brought to flower here in the Egyptian desert. They have chosen a dwelling place afar in lonely places, but their eyes are turned to the high stars, the very deep of truth. Freedom they seek, an emptiness apart from worthless hopes. Their senses kindled like a torch that may blaze through the secrets of eternity. Monasticism has always been at the heart of the Coptic Church, and the monastic ideal of a life wholly devoted to God stands as a reminder to all Copts of the importance of dedication and self-denial. Today, the tradition is still held that the patriarch and his bishops be chosen from the monks of these desert communities. Here, in this desert oasis, lies the real spiritual strength of the Coptic Church. It is Easter, a time of spring and a time of flowers. All over Cairo, large wreaths of flowers are assembled on every street corner. Easter is a time for weddings. Family ties are traditionally strong in the Middle East and a Coptic wedding is a family occasion. It is still common for parents to help choose a marriage partner for their children. As a result, a Coptic marriage is rarely between two individuals. It involves two... Since church ceremonies are forbidden during Lent, many couples have waited all this time to celebrate their marriage. In this one Coptic church in Zamalek, on the Sunday after Easter, five weddings were scheduled on the same evening, one every hour.
The bride, Tagrid Rushdi Azizi, is 26. Her husband, Sobi Nagib Bulas, is 35. They are both graduate engineers, but would probably never have met each other as potential marriage partners without their parents' intervention. In this traditional wedding service, the bride and groom are crowned, they exchange rings, and are blessed by Bishop Samuel. As they move to the altar to receive the final blessing, the blind cantor exclaims in ancient Coptic, O groom, take this bride that is given to you by Christ himself. So Christ is present. He confirms the bond of marriage and gives it his blessing. Copts look on marriage as a bond that perpetuates their church. The primary function of each new marriage is raising a family and transmitting Coptic values to their children. In the world of Islam, it protects the continuity and strength of the Coptic community. the Nile Valley, the promise of renewal has been fulfilled. An abundant new harvest has been brought forth. 
A new season along this river, in this desert of mystic vision where Pharaoh Ikhnaten first saw one source of all creation. Beautiful is thine appearing, thou living sun. The first who lived, thou hast fashioned the earth according to thy desire with man, and all that is upon the earth, thou alone. Seeding, growing, harvesting, birth, life, death, have been the interlocking cycles of centuries unchanging. The Lord our God is one. To that Lord, the Prophet Muhammad calls for a life of submission, for he is the Lord of the worlds. The resurrected seed is a visible sign of the spiritual resurrection of Easter. From one God, creator, redeemer, sustainer, Christians rejoice in the promise of a dazzling harvest. Through the rising of the Son of Man, a new season for the glory of all creation.